What's up, Ego Hackers? Welcome to Season 17, Episode 3. And uh, this one's been a long time coming, but we just finished Season 10 and we just finished Season 14. So it's like, okay, yeah, let's just keep on moving right along because why not? We're here, aren't we? And uh, Season 17 is the dopest because it's like super mega metaphysical. At least the first half of it is. And the latter half is actually a bit more technical. But I think this particular episode is going to be pretty fun because it is going to be educational and yet metaphysical. Maybe not as metaphysical as the first two episodes, but metaphysical enough. You know what I'm saying? Because so we're going to be talking about Jungian theory. The theory of the subconscious, actually. Um, so yeah, this is uh, episode three. What is the subconscious and its gateway? We talked about uh, in the last uh, two episodes, uh, the source of all cognition, episode one. And then we talked about the ego and what its gateway is and its gateway function is the hero function. But in this particular uh, episode, we're gonna be talking about the inferior function, which is the gateway into the subconscious. Uh, the subconscious is a um, probably um, one of the most mysterious of the uh, sides of the mind, of the different four sides of the mind, but it is also one of the most important, if not the most important, uh, side of the mind, but we're doing it second because it's the second one in priority because like why not? So anyway, this particular uh, this this particular side of the mind is uh, shrouded in mystery and the reason why it's shrouded in mystery is because no one quite seems to know how it works. I mean you can kind of look around at that guy, you know, Sigmund Freud, uh, who kind of like has an idea as to what it is. Uh, my cat just uh, decided to be part of the uh, live studio audience. Hi, Chloe. Yeah, are you gonna be meowing during my lecture? I mean, that's that's pretty uh, that's pretty fantastic there. I mean, why not? Why not meow during a lecture? I mean, I would. You know what I'm saying? She's an ESFJ cat, by the way. For those that uh, want to know, um, but yeah, uh, quite frankly, the the main purpose of the subconscious or developing the subconscious is finding happiness. Uh, it's no secret that in the past, like some of my lectures or even in some of my Q&As or how to type live streams, I've mentioned that developing the subconscious or the second side of the mind uh, is basically the path for developing one's uh, sense of happiness. And you can see this all the time, especially like the best example that we have so far on the channel is uh, Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift is an ESFP. She's INTJ focused. Uh, she's very subconscious focused due to her mother at an early age. Uh, getting her into aspiration mode, and then she was able to become a very capable uh, strategist, uh, which led to her uh, uh, delivering a fantastic uh, billboard uh, record uh, hitting uh, music, etc. And it started at an early age. I think she was uh, making songs at six or seven, for example, and started her career early. Uh, and then they even moved to Nashville, etc., for, for all of that. Uh, but again, a person, and this is a fact, a person is at their happiest when they have developed their subconscious side of their mind. So that means in order to gain access to the subconscious side of the mind, you have to develop your inferior function and you have to turn that inferior function into an aspirational function. And then as a result of that, you can gain the happiness that comes from developing your subconscious. And let me tell you folks, you have no choice. See, you have to do that because if you don't, you're going to endure what we call midlife crisis. Midlife crisis literally is just that thing that comes in the middle of your life, you know, when you're in your 40s or 50s, et cetera, especially it's kind of actually starts around 38 to 48, I would say is kind of where midlife crisis kind of starts to hit people uh, typically. And that's usually because their subconscious is underdeveloped. Hi, kitty. Yes, if only your tail was long enough to just go across the screen, yes. She is a beautiful uh, gray uh, tabby with uh, little blonde highlights in her uh, in her coat. It is so dope, and she's like super mega soft and a very lovely cat. Glad to have her here with me. Um, so, uh, but anyway, uh, but yes, uh, to find happiness, you have to develop your subconscious, and your mind will force you to develop your subconscious, whether you like it or not. Uh, and, it, and if it has to force you, well, guess what? You have midlife crisis. It, your brain or your mind will force development. So whether you like it or not, you will have to endure midlife crisis unless you get ahead of it. Now, obviously, Taylor Swift is not necessarily going to get ahead of it, but again, because she's very subconscious focused, she has to endure the fact that she's not exactly very unconscious focused, which we're gonna be talking about in the next lecture in episode four, 
when we talk about the unconscious in more depth and, and the uh, usefulness and the uh, value of the unconscious. Uh, but like I've said before, the unconscious is for maturity, whereas the subconscious is for, uh, it's for uh, uh, happiness, developing one sense of happiness. It's very, very, very key. So uh, anyway, uh, so let's talk about, uh, let's talk about what uh, the uh, subconscious is typically or traditionally referred to as. Now, this is kind of where things get a little pretty gray area because, a little pretty gray area, what an interesting way of saying it. Um, so my mentor, R.P. Morial, uh, had a, a different way of looking at the, um, the subconscious and he called it the anima or the animus. Uh, also, um, Mr. Artie Bryant as well, uh, my ESTP mentor, uh, both of them had the same kind of point of view when it came to the anima or the animus for a long time. And then uh, my INFJ mentor, R.P. Morial, actually changed his point of view on it later. And right now, I'm actually possibly even going to change my point of view on it even more. Uh, so traditional, let's talk about the traditional theory of the subconscious. It's known as the anima or the animus. Now, if you're a woman and you have, let's say, ESFJ ego, that means you have uh, INTP animus. The animus is the male variant. So what that means, is, or, or if, you were, if you were an ENTJ male, that means you have an ISFP anima, okay? So the anima is the female version and the animus is the male version. And what does that mean? That means that your subconscious is supposed to hold the opposing gender the opposing gender of what your ego is. So if your ego is male, your subconscious is female, which basically means every single person out there has feminine components and masculine components between the difference uh, between their ego or their subconscious. So that's why when your inferior function gets hit from a negative uh, external force or maybe even a negative internal force of some kind, the reaction is kind of like people react in the opposite of their gender, basically. Uh, like an INFP man and having that TE inferior hit and they come out with this ESTJ uh, feminine uh, reaction, basically, uh, negative reaction of some kind. And then it's like all of a sudden they were very manly at first, but then all of a sudden they're behaving like a woman. And it's like, wait a minute, that's, that's a little weird. Uh, but that's why, because remember folks, you have primary and secondary, you have that yin and yang uh, relationship uh, within our minds, the primary and secondary, etc. And it's no different when it comes to the anima or the animus. The anima or the animus or the subconscious contains this opposing gender variant. Now, where the theories kind of divert from that, well, it's a little bit interesting because while that's the generally accepted traditional viewpoint, uh, uh, my INFJ mentor uh, actually started theorizing that maybe it wasn't always the case. Maybe sometimes it was actually the unconscious that would have the masculine or feminine traits. Uh, and he, he, he did some uh, experimenting in this area to try to figure out if that was the case. And uh, the fact that, uh, that he even performed those experiments to begin with and those studies um, gave me the opportunity to actually study it even further when I realized that, oh, well, guess what? Uh, the starter types, uh, the starter interaction style and the background interaction style just happen to be more feminine than the masculine uh, uh, structure types or the masculine finisher types, right? So maybe that opposing gender that is typically taught to people within the anima or animus theory is not necessarily, not necessarily true. Uh, I would offer my theory. And my theory is, you know, basically, as I said, the interaction style. So like, uh, ver uh, the, and the, uh, the, the masculine or feminine approach within the interaction styles. So for example, why don't, why don't I just, you know, put it out, right? So you have for yourselves, you have the, uh, you have structure, you have starter, you have finisher, and you have background, okay? So, and then you have, uh, you have masculine, you have feminine, you have masculine, you have feminine, and you have four types in each of these interaction styles all the way across the board. And each of those four types kind of have like a, a masculine feeling or a feminine feeling to it in terms of their behavior, right? 
So I'm an ENTP, right? I'm a starter type, so that kind of means I'm kind of more effeminate, basically. Even though I'm a man and, and exhibit male qualities and can be ha uh, held to male standards, etc., I am still kind of effeminate in that way because, uh, uh, you know, I'm high maintenance. I, I kind of, I kind of, and it's why, you know, typically when people think of ENTPs, they think of female ENTPs more so than male ENTPs. And male ENTPs have it harder than female ENTPs because it is just generally accepted by society that an ENTP should be more female, right? Or an ESFJ should be more female. And ESFJ men often get harangued by other fellow SJ men for being too girly, etc. And that's why, right? We have all these little cultural biases. Biases? Hmm, is that the plural for bias? I think so. All these cultural, cultural bias that we have to deal with when it comes to these types. And again, it's no different with the anima or the animus or the subconscious, right? So from a subconscious point of view, how do we deal with that? Like, how do we, how do we get around that uh, with the competing theories? The competing theory is just that, okay, hey, you know, if you're, um, um, you know, it, again, so if you're an ENTJ, that means your ISFP subconscious would be the opposite gender of your ego. Or maybe it's not. Maybe, uh, maybe if you're an ENTJ or maybe if you're an ENTP and ISFJ is also background, you know, they're both female, but then like the, the unconscious is male, right? So if you think about it, wait a minute, are some types double feminine? Are some types triple feminine? Are some types, you know, uh, or double masculine, etc.? There's a lot of different ways of looking at it. Look at ISTPs, for example, and their unconscious is ESTJ, and then they have ENFJ as their subconscious. Wait a minute, that's like triple masculine. Ooh, you see what I'm saying, folks? There's a completely different way of looking at it. And that's the theory that I maintain. I don't necessarily personally believe in the anima or the animus, although there is something to that theory. Uh, so I'm presenting both theories right now, and I think I'm just gonna leave it up to the audience to kind of like think about this a little bit. Leave leave comments in the comments section, and why, while you're at it, like seriously, subscribe to the channel. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, if you haven't gotten every family member uh, or friend of yours to subscribe to this channel, what are you doing? Like, please support this community. Like, we're on the road to 20,000 subscribers. We're about 1,500 away, so like, let's kick some ass here and definitely get those subscriber count up, you know? We need to get some more. You know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, we can't let these other, you know, MBTI YouTubers who don't actually know what they're talking about have more subscriber counts than us. I mean, that would be kind of ridiculous, wouldn't it? Don't you think? Anyway, the point is, these two theories, you know, they're two competing theories. You know, what does the audience think? Do you guys think that the anima and animus theory, you guys can look it up. It's actually, there's plenty of books on the subject out there about the anima and animus. Is that theory more correct? Or is it, uh, or is my theory about the interaction styles and their associated genders more correct. Uh, I honestly, I really think this is the way it is. I, I think there's more evidence for it, uh, especially you know in my own life and some of the studying that I've done. And this theory, um, I was able to develop it specifically because my mentor just decided questioning anima and animus theory. And it's like, mm, not entirely sure that's very accurate. And uh, and to which I started to you know test it out and kind of look at other people and observe and do a lot of people watching and, and study it and I honestly think he's correct. I think he's correct. However, he didn't exactly develop a system around it. I mean, because I mean he's an INFJ, he's not very systematic. But then I was able to develop this system with the interaction styles to kind of identify, okay, hey, some people are just more masculine and more feminine than others, and that's fine. We should definitely um, you know do our best to respect those people, but. It goes even a little bit deeper. So why is it important, uh, you know, when it comes to anima and animus theory? Well, that theory, we're going to go in a little bit deeper uh, because we just created this other theory um, and we did pretty deep on this one. To, to, make, to look at it a little bit deeper, uh, you know, from a masculine feminine point of view, uh, the, the opposing gender. Um, remember, uh, we, we have the uh, model of order versus chaos, which is what uh, the ego exists. But when you're looking at the anima animus or the subconscious specifically, it really is the feminine challenging the masculine, right? Remember, it is the feminine's job to challenge the masculine. The feminine represents the yin, it also represents chaos, whereas the masculine represents the yang or represents order. It is always chaos's job to 
challenge order. It is always the feminine's job to challenge the masculine. Ladies, if you're watching this and you're not challenging your husbands or your boyfriends, they're not really going to grow. It is the feminine's job to challenge or question the manhood of men in their life. It's very important. You have to do this. It's important for women in, in our lives as men to be challenged by our women so that we continue to maintain that standard of manhood because no one else is. The problem is in our society that the standard of manhood is not exactly that something that exists anymore. Uh, I, another reference point uh, for you folks, uh, read the book uh, by Warren Farrell, uh, The Boy Crisis. He goes into an excellent uh, dissertation as to why uh, this, uh, uh, why it's so difficult uh, you know, for, for boys to actually become men and why manhood is fading from society. It's because the, la the, the lack of uh, the rite of passage, the lack of these rituals that all of society respects, uh, that if you pass this test, you are considered a man by the rest of society and people will respect you as such because you gain that status of manhood, that TE status of manhood, etc. But that doesn't even exist in our society. And because of that, there is no actual standard. This is why I offer a standard of manhood in seasons four, six, and 13. Okay, and by the way, like if you are a subscriber of this channel and you haven't even bothered looking at the playlists and you haven't even bothered watching seasons four, six, and 13, what are you doing? Like seriously, stop, like literally stop watching this lecture and go watch those real quick. Season four is about how do intimate relationships actually work? or season six. It's all about how, um, what are the four pillars of self-intimacy so you can help build yourself up to prepare yourself for a relationship. And then there's season 13, which explains in deep the arch archetypes of the, the Jungian archetypes of the mature masculine and the mature feminine, all laid out for you. Use that information so that you can come to a better understanding of where you need to be from your, you know, with your manhood or your womanhood, etc., so that you can become more mature you know, and have like healthy uh, relationships with people. That would be nice, don't you think? But again, it's all about the, the, the subconscious, you know, within anima and animus theory, it's all about having the opposing gender and really challenging the masculine. Super, super important. And uh, we already talked about the competing theories, male versus female or genders of each side of the mind. Just remember that in this particular theory here, there are different genders and some people, someone could be like triple masculine, triple feminine, uh, you know, and wait a minute, that goes even deeper. Here's the thing though, I'm actually gonna fast forward to this right here, transgenderism. I haven't really spoken about transgenderism much on the lecture, but transgenderism is a thing. Now, a lot of people think like it's this like, oh, you know, gender is a choice and guys, because gender is a choice, we have to respect people who think they're like a different gender, you know, like, okay, I understand that. And I get that everyone just wants to have this social free for all and, you know, be like this insane libertarian left approach, which is the uh, socially pragmatic um, way of doing things where everyone just can choose their gender or where they could choose their sexual orientation, where they can choose these things. Now, I granted some people will be like, wait a minute, there's no such thing as choosing your sexual orientation. Actually, I disagree. Why? Well, granted, there are some people who have their sexual orientation and that's just who they are and that's fine. I don't have a problem with those people, but I've also coached so many INFJs out there who have like that, that who, who fail that one masculine feminine relationship that they had in high school. And then they swear off that. And it's like they literally immaturely door slam an entire gender and then decide that they want to be gay because they don't think they're a good enough FI critic for, you know, any woman. And that is a choice of sexual orientation. And I have had to, through coaching so many times, reveal to the INFJs more so than any other type because it's them that do this. I haven't really met any other type that does this and tell them like, hey, you know, that failed relationship in your past gives you no right to like swear off that entire gender and door slam that gender and then start preferring, you know, your current gender because it's just, it's just easy. It's like living life on the easy button. Like stop doing that, okay? You're making actual gay people, actual homosexual people look bad and it's offensive. Stop doing it, please. Like it's annoying and it's really annoying to them, okay? You know, the people who are actually homosexual, that would be nice, you know? Stop, stop doing that. Like you're harming, you're harming culture. You're, you're harming, you're harming people by, by doing that, you know? And then it's like, and it's funny how like the majority of those INFJs I've coached become, you know, furries. Huh. 
I don't, it's, it's, it's crazy to me. It's just crazy to me. Like, seriously, grow up. Grow up and stop judging an entire gender based on like that one bad experience, that one bad relationship you had in high school. I'm getting tired of it. In the last year, I have coached six different INFJs on just this. Wow, like stop it. It's really annoying. And grow up guys, seriously grow up, don't do that. But transgenderism open, begs the question. I mean, okay, yeah, so what is transgenderism? So transgenderism, if we were actually gonna go look into it from the science, uh, and this is gonna be very polarizing to the audience, and I'm sure a lot of people are like, oh, you're so insensitive, C.S. Johnson. I'm like, how, how can you like even go there? And it's like, no, it's not about that. Again, folks, I'm not here to make you happy. I'm here to just to tell you the truth, you know? And transgenderism has been typically known as gender dysphoria, which is a technical mental illness, which is caused by T. gondii bacteria, which comes from house cats, which gets into children, which changes their brain chemistry, which causes gender dysphoria, for example. And that is a thing which happens in our society because the standard American diet reduces the blood brain barrier effect also because of our low circadian rhythms. If you don't know about circadian rhythm, look it up. You can learn about it at theenergyblueprint.com. If you wanna learn about T. gondii, bacterial infection, getting into the brain, you can find out about that at fixyourgut.com. And you can, you know, gender dysphoria was known as a mental illness in like the early 1900s, for example. Like this is not a new thing, but apparently we just have to like label transgenderism like a thing. Now, that's not to say that I'm here to disrespect transgendered people. I have a lot of transgendered friends that I hang out with on a regular basis and I treat them with respect and I do not make their life harder. I don't label them. I don't tell them they're bad people. I don't even tell them they're mentally ill. It's not about that. I'm trying to get down to the science as to why they're behaving this way. It's not about that. I'm not here to inhibit their lives. If they want to wear their clothes and behave differently, that's their business. Guess what? It's a free country. And guess what? Because it's a free country, I will defend their right to be free, right? It's not about me. It's not about me dictating to them how they live their lives or their belief system, okay? We have this thing called coexisting. Maybe we should do it instead of like being judgmental because I mean, you know, who are you to judge your neighbor? I mean, James chapter four, I believe, or maybe it's chapter five, and it says like, you know, uh, there's only one who has the power to save and destroy, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Yeah, exactly. I'm not here to judge transgendered people. I'm not here to judge homosexual people. I'm not here to do that. I don't care about that, you know? Y'all are great people. Fine, be great and do, and have your own culture and do your own thing. I'm not here to tell you how to live your life. I'm not here to make you feel worthless or valueless or, or devalue you. It's not about that. What I am here to say is, is that when you consider the subconscious, when you consider the fact that there's a really good chance or the fact that there's um, that, uh, you know, uh, something that's more effeminate or something that's more masculine, when you are in a like when you're in a body but has a personality that may be like triple feminine or triple uh, masculine, etc. You know, like for example, I have never actually met an ISTP who would be considered triple masculine because all the sides of their mind, like their ego, their subconscious, their unconscious, they're all technically masculine based on this model. I have never met one that's transgender. So think about that. Regardless of Regardless of T. gondii or mental illness or anything about that, look at it from a Jungian psychology point of view when it comes to transgenderism. My question is to this audience, do you think that there's a correlation between the, uh, the overarching uh, gender approach to the interaction styles has anything to do with transgenderism? Maybe there's a higher chance when someone develops gender dysphoria. If they're a triple feminine, yet they're in a male body, maybe they end up becoming transgendered, right? I wonder if there's a statistical connection there, right? I don't have the evidence for it. It's just a theory at this point, but it seems like there's something to that. And maybe we could actually get some answers as to what the phenomenon of transgenderism is. But again, I'm not here to tell you people that you're a bad person because you're transgendered. I'm not here to tell you you're mentally ill. I'm just saying this is just something to look into, right? I mean, is T. gondii a thing? Is gender dysphoria a thing? I mean, doctors have believed so since the 1900s. So, I mean, we should probably look into that. Like, just like, like look it up, do your own research. You know what I'm saying? And, and because like there's so many questions around there, I don't think it's right for us to be like 
changing you know public policy to match certain people's lifestyles you know what i'm saying like it's like it's like you're 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 punishing the entire class for like something one person did wrong for example you know what i'm saying we need to not do that in our society uh, we need to take a very pragmatic maybe even a malcolm x approach to it instead of like just trying to have this major authoritarian approach that everyone else you know this affiliative approach that everyone else is trying to force everyone to, uh, down everyone's throats because like right now you have the, the, the Democrats who are the authoritarian left who are affiliative and then you have the, um, the Republicans who are the authoritarian right who just happen to be also be affiliative but there's like no pragmatic in there which is the like libertarian left and right. Like what about those people? That would be nice, you know. And yeah, every time I take the test I end up showing up as a centrist so who knows how that works. But anyway, like again, just with, with transgenderism, just guys understand that there's something psychologically going on here uh, with, with the four sides of the mind uh, in, and possibly in conjunction with that T. gondii infection, uh, gender dysphoria, etc. But I, I think it begs the question, you know, is there a correlation between the two? Is there a correlation? Like, I, I would like to know the answer to that question. And I think I would like to challenge the scientific community as well as the medical community to find out, you know, is, is there really something that could correlate that? Because again, when it comes to four sides of the mind and each four side of the mind having um, a kind of uh, um, a gender approach to it, it's, it's, it's important, right? It's important to understand that, you know, and maybe then certain types we could statistically say they're more likely to become transgendered and less likely to become transgendered than others, right? I would venture to guess that the ISTP is probably the least likely uh, to become um, uh, transgendered as much as the ESTP is. I think STPs have like the least likelihood. I've never met a transgendered STP before. I haven't, right? So, Keep that in mind. Like I've met a lot of transgender people, and I have not met, um, I have not met uh, an STP one. I have met a bunch of INFJ ones. Keep that in mind. That's kind of that's also very interesting. I've coached many. In fact, my very, 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 very first coaching client ever was a transgendered uh, uh, um, uh, INFJ. Right. And of course, they understand, you know, my, my position on gender dysphoria and T. gondii and whatnot, and uh, and also uh, the four the four sides of the mind in conjunction with the interaction styles, etc. So it's it's just very interesting. But does that stop them from living their life the way that they want to live it? No. Are they free to do so? Yes. So am I going to disrespect them for it? No, I'm not going to. Uh, so many other people do, and you know, and. I mean, that's, that's what happens. I guess that's, that it comes to the territory when they make that choice. So, I mean, it is what it is, right? So, happiness versus maturity. See, that's the thing when it comes to subconscious that we need to be aware of. While the subconscious, uh, you know, as we move away from the gender topic, uh, the subconscious itself, um, the subconscious itself is supposed to be, uh, you know, it's the path to happiness. As you develop your gateway function, which is the inferior function, you turn from inferior to aspirational. When it gets away from fear and more towards faith, when you start to have faith in yourself, you have confidence in yourself, self-confidence in your inferior function. It causes your inferior function to become less insecure and more secure. When it's more secure, you're able to aspire with it, right? And become a better person, more capable person, and a happier person. And that's what happens. But remember, the third gateway function is your nemesis function, and that is the pathway for developing maturity. Now, just because you develop your subconscious does not necessarily mean you're going to be mature. I mean, look at Taylor Swift. She's very subconscious focused, but she's kind of, she's actually a lot less mature compared to other ESFPs in her life. And that's a consistent issue, right? A consistent issue. Uh, definitely not something to do. And if you want to even look at it this way, you look at the subconscious more linked to the tree of life, you know, according to like the Bible, and then you could have the, uh, um, you could also have the, um, uh, the unconscious actually attached to the tree of knowledge, right? Because of, you know, the maturity, you know, and, and potentially a tree of knowledge leading to wisdom, for example. Okay. Like I am triggering so many people right now by like talking about gender and tree of life and tree of knowledge. I get it, folks. I already know that I'm going to be getting a phone call about this from someone and then he's going to call me and be like, you're damn right, I'm calling you about this. This is crap, Chase. How dare you say this on your YouTube channel? What are you even doing? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I get it. 
But like the point is you have to realize is that once you become aspirational, it's you're you really are on that that path to happiness and eventually you are on your path to the tree of life. What is the tree of life? The tree of life is that tree that grants immortality to mankind and it was supposed to be in the garden of Eden. The problem is is that after eating the tree of knowledge, eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge, Mankind was kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and then the flaming sword of truth guarded the entrance to the Garden of Eden such that mankind could never enter into the Garden of Eden in order to actually gain access to the Tree of Life and then gain immortality. So that sucks. That sucks that that happened, but it was necessary for that to happen. Why is that? Because when you know the truth, you're no longer ignorant. And this comes into like the ignorance is bliss argument, right? Ignorance is bliss, right? But then again, someone can argue that ignorance is actually hell, right? They, and that's what the occultists would very much espouse. I'm not entirely sure if uh, Christians or Muslims would, would argue ignorance is bliss. But, um, but yes, I maintain that uh, ignorance is definitely hell because like, cause here's the thing. If you're actually wise, you can have anything you want in this life. Uh, focus on wisdom, not focus on attaining. Like, here's the thing. If I had the choice between wisdom or billions of dollars, I'd take the wisdom every time, every, every, every single time. Because if I have wisdom, I can have anything I want in this world. And that is much more important to me, like way more important. Uh, it's like the most important thing, right? Uh, I mean, there's obviously love and whatnot, but again, how can you love someone if you can't like understand them and you kind of can't reach understanding unless you have wisdom, right? So maybe you should have wisdom first. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's a requirement, it's a prerequisite. But from an ignorance is bliss point, you know, that's kind of how the subconscious behaves. Um, because, you know, uh, Jesus said, you know, if you're going to enter in the kingdom of heaven, you have to come as a child, right? And it's kind of interesting how the child, the divine child, which is the third function, combines with the inferior function when it's aspiring to help develop the inverse of the ego and then it becomes subconscious so here comes what we call inverse theory look up inverse theory inverse theory is about how you have the four cognitive functions of the ego and they flip upside down and then they become the subconscious and by flipping upside down they have inversed and they could do it in a positive way an inferior way an insecure way or could do or and that's a negative way, excuse me, or the positive way, which is the aspirational, secure way of doing it, right? And if you read that book, Attached, where it talks about attachment styles, healthy and unhealthy attachment styles, I think the attachment styles have a lot to do with a person's subconscious development based on the inferior function, whether or not it's actually being inferior or if it's being more aspirational, depending on how well developed they are, right? This is one of the reasons why right now I am actively working on developing my inferior function by uh, getting into the gym, uh, hopefully you know, reducing my body fat percentage, getting a lot of strength, uh, learning Jeet Kune Do and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Maybe I'll compete one day, but it's for the purpose of teaching my son and so that I can become stronger and stronger and stronger, et cetera. You know, those things you know, mean a lot to me and uh, that's because I'm developing self-discipline and then as a result, developing my inferior function and turning into an aspirational function so I can use the ISFJ side of my mind on a consistent basis. My ISFJ side is a background type, so it is actually more feminine, so that I, my ISFJ side of my mind is kind of like a woman, et cetera, even though my ego is kind of like that as well, even though I am a man. And, uh, so it's very, it's very interesting how things are in balance like that, yin and yang equilibrium amongst the functions of the mind in the same way like uh, atoms and electrons and protons are all in equilibrium with each other with primary and secondary charges all the way across the board same concept right so again uh ignorance is bliss versus ignorance is hell because if if you are <laughs> when you are aspiring it, you're kind of also being ignorant because you are taking that inner ignorance is bliss because you are taking that leap of faith right i have to take a leap, take a leap of faith that if I'm gonna behave the opposite of who I am, then I'm going to become a better version of myself. And that's the point of the subconscious, folks. You are trying to become a better version of yourself. Uh, what's not written on the board is that like fathers, for example, uh, they all do this every single time. Fathers are always trying to live vicariously through their children and they do it through their, you guessed it, subconscious. Their subconscious is everything that they do. So people live vicariously through their children with their subconscious. My father did this to me when I was little. 
he wanted me to uh, you know, be a craftsman. His ISTP subconscious, because he's an ENFJ, he wanted me to work on cars with him, he wanted me to become a grease monkey, etc. He would have loved to have a son that you know, was more like his subconscious, etc. And he would do things uh, in that regard on a regular basis. And at times I felt like I was being unfairly judged for not being more like a subconscious uh, while growing up. Uh, but that comes with the territory. And it's kind of interesting. Also with my son, who is 9FJ, I'm constantly trying to encourage him to get into a martial arts, right? Yet that's what I should be doing for my subconscious. And then it's like, wait a minute, my ISFJ uh, subconscious is, is, um, is living vicariously through my son right now. Wait a minute, I should like maybe question whether or not I should be doing that or not. You know what I'm saying? That's where that comes from, right? So be careful about living vicariously through your children and realize it comes from your subconscious, okay? It is one thing to be aware of. But, you know, uh, as you develop your subconscious, you know, it's, it, it becomes a blissful, heavenly experience because you are the best version of yourself. But it's not about the maturity. It's not about the wisdom. It's about just being a better version of you uh, that's, that's focused on gaining happiness. And let me tell you folks, children, they're aspirational. Uh, we talked a little bit about this in the last CSJ conference, and we're talking about this more in uh, season 17 uh, for child development, uh, but cognitive functions and how they develop in children and what side of the mind a child is focused on. There's, there's the there's quadra shift theory, but there's also the theory of the aspirational theory where when children are born and what type they are, they are basically stuck in their subconscious developing their ego and then, then they finally get into their ego, then they are trying to get back to their subconscious. The subconscious basically is the best expression of a person's child function, but that child function can only be accessed through the mirror or through the side or through the gateway of the inferior function instead of being accessed through the hero function. And why is that? Well, that's because the parent function is completely bypassed in that regard because the old child function becomes the, uh, the new parent function and the old parent function becomes the new child when you're doing the inverse into the subconscious side of the mind. This is very important. Please understand this. Uh, this is why, you know, when, when you talk about, oh, you know, whoever can enter into the kingdom of heaven should be like a child. Well, guess what? You become very childlike after developing your subconscious because you're happy. You're like the happiest version of you, right? It's like you've reached heaven on earth all of a sudden. And, you know, and, it's, and you just kind of don't care. And then it's like, ooh, wait a minute, ignorance, is it, is it really bliss, right? You see what I'm saying? That's the model that you're going for when it comes to subconscious development. And that's how the subconscious can make you a better person. When you hear about people talking about continuous improvement or Kaizen, for example, uh, uh, or neuro-linguistic programming uh, as per Tony Robbins, for example, uh, and those kinds of concepts, motivational speaking, it's all about causing people to further develop their subconscious because people who go to Tony Robbins to complain about being unhappy in their lives is because their subconscious is not developed. I, I, I even recommended today that someone begin the process, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're in their late 30s and it's like you need to start building, beginning the process, developing your subconscious right now or you won't be happy right? This can be an issue. So be aware of that. It's, it, it can definitely be an issue. So develop your subconscious, folks. And like I said, if you don't develop your subconscious, you will have midlife crisis. You can prevent midlife crisis right now by developing your subconscious right now and make it a priority. It's very easy. I'm making it a priority and I'm 32 years old, okay? I am making it a priority every single day to develop my subconscious. It's absolutely critical that you do this. And because otherwise you're gonna have midlife crisis and then all of a sudden you're gonna have divorce on your hands, you're gonna be alone, what are your children gonna think of you? It's just gonna turn into an absolute nightmare. And you deserved it because you didn't spend time developing your subconscious. Kinda of nutso, right? So then your inferior starts going from insecure to secure and it becomes aspirational. And then all of a sudden you have all the, uh, the, uh, the um, you have all of the, um, uh, the growth in the world that you need. You're able to achieve things that you've never been able to achieve before. Who can imagine that a fat kid in school who was 287 pounds when he was 14 years old, going into, going into high school, right, 
And then all of a sudden, when he's like 34 years old, he's a kung fu master uh, of some kind and able to compete in mixed martial arts on a regular basis. You know, who, who saw that company coming? That's because people have these amazing transformations. You, you hear about people who like, you know, you see photos of them when they were in school as a small child, all of a sudden, like when they're in their 30s, and it's like, wow, you're a completely different person. Yeah, well, that's because they develop their subconscious. Okay, and it is how they reach the path to integration, aka the path to enlightenment. Okay, you have to do this, you have to develop your happiness, folks. And if you don't, your mind will force you to. You will be forced to against your will, and it will be a very painful and costly process. Remember, folks, life is not about what is good and what is bad. Life is not about what is true or false. Life, life is about what is wise and what is not. And let me tell you, folks, it is wise for you to develop your subconscious. If you are not going to develop your subconscious, what are you doing? It's absolutely critical. You will not be happy in this life without developing your subconscious. And if you're even to think, uh, you will not reach integration. You will not reach enlightenment. Think of the spiritual implications, folks, about not developing your, your subconscious. When like, for example, the Bible says you can't enter in the kingdom of heaven unless you enter it into it like a child. Well, guess what, folks? That's not gonna happen unless you're developing your subconscious. So get to it. Start developing your subconscious. Humble yourself. See, that's the thing, folks, a lot of people don't realize. How do you actually develop your inferior function into an aspirational function? First step is you have to be willing to admit that you're not all that in a bag of chips. You have to be willing to humble yourself. Are you gonna humble yourself? Hmm. Are you? Maybe you should. Maybe you should humble yourself. Maybe you should. Just like women, for example, have to have humility in order to have beauty. Humility is a prerequisite to beauty, right? The subconscious, according to anima animus theory, is the opposing gender, right? If you're a man and you have a female uh, subconscious, well, guess what? Maybe you should humble yourself, but that's not the point. Everyone with an inferior function has to humble themselves because they have to realize that they're inferior in certain areas of their life. And in order to get over those inferiorities, they need to make it into superiorities through practice, through mastery. Right? Read Robert Greene's book, Mastery, by the way. Oh, and while you're at it, read Robert Greene's book, The 50th Law. Those two books specifically talk about how to develop the inferior function and change it into an aspirational function. It's all there in those two books. Let me tell you, folks, you want to be on the fast track of developing your subconscious and developing your inferior function? You read those two books immediately. I guarantee you, it'd be the most important books you've ever read in your life. You wanna be on the path to integration? You wanna be on the path to enlightenment? You probably should read those. It would make sense, okay? Not that hard. Just understand that. So remember, gain wisdom, right? Now, how do you gain wisdom? Well, obviously you need to be integrated. Obviously you need to gain happiness within your subconscious. And then obviously you need to gain maturity through your unconscious. But remember folks, it's not, some people are very subconscious focused, other people are very unconscious focused. This can cause a problem. It can cause a man or a woman to be out of balance. That's the issue. In order to reach integration, in order to reach enlightenment, in order for your mind to be healthy enough to actually just start integrating your superego and developing your superego, you know, the fourth side of your mind, you have to achieve these things ahead of time. And in order to achieve these things ahead of time, you need to humble yourself, recognize that you're not all that in a bag of chips, and recognize that there are things that you need to work on and you need to own up to it, even publicly. Take responsibility for your actions. Take responsibility for you. And you do realize that if you do not spend time developing your subconscious, much less any side of your mind for that matter, and you have children and you're a parent, you are harming your children because you are being a bad example to your children. Stop doing it. Start taking charge. You need to go to the gym, you probably should. If you wanna know how to go to the gym properly, go to eat2perform.com, have them manage your food. And then go to Greg O'Gallagher's Kino Body System. If you're a man, get Kino Warrior. If you're a woman, get the Kino System for women, etc. and do it, they work, okay? Greg O'Gallagher, he's a great dude, he's an ESTP, dope dude. 
really, really got that INFJ subconscious working out for him. So figure that out, folks. Make it happen. You want to be happy, become the best version of yourself. You have to develop your subconscious to do it. Because, folks, if you want life, and life more abundant, you know, that thing that Jesus said, you know, well, you kind of have to be willing to humble yourself and become like a child. And the only way that's going to happen is through subconscious development. Turn your inferior your function, turn your insecurities, turn your fears into faith, into confidence, into security, and use those things to succeed. Because without them, well, you're not going to get anywhere in this life. You can't become integrated and you can't be enlightened. So instead, take responsibility, maintain these things, seek them out, make them happen. Because if you don't, midlife crisis is coming and it will swallow you alive. And guess what? It will take down every other person who is closely connected to you with it. You have a chance to prevent it now. And if you're dealing with midlife crisis right now, well, I just gave you the books to read, The 50th Law and Mastery to get you started. I just gave you a gym plan and a food plan to get you started. Start optimizing your circadian rhythm. Really focus on your health. I mean, if you're eating the standard American diet or the Western diet, huh, God help you. You know, read uh, In Defense of Food by Michael, Pilon, Michael Pollan or Deep Nutrition by Dr. Catherine Shanahan and really understand the genetic consequences that you're passing on to your children and that your children are passing on because of your irresponsibility. Make yourself better. Humble yourselves. Humble yourselves. I cannot stress that enough. Everyone has to humble themselves because no one is perfect, because we are all incomplete. We have the advantage of enjoying life a lot more because of how incomplete we are, but we have all these obstacles and challenges to overcome because of how incomplete we are. But luckily, we have a path forward to reach integration, to reach enlightenment. You have to develop your subconscious, but at least the reward is you will be happy afterwards. You want happiness, folks? This is how you do it. Develop your inferior function, use that gateway in your subconscious, develop your subconscious, become the best you that there ever was for the sake of yourself and your children and your future. If you found this lecture useful, helpful, educational, and enlightening, please subscribe to the channel here on YouTube. Leave a comment while you're at it and a like, and also like the bell for like additional videos. Uh, if you'd like to uh, gain access to our private lectures, we have one completed season right now in our Patreon gold tier. Uh, uh, Patreon.com forward slash CS Joseph. Sign up for gold tier. Uh, you can have access to our first romantic compatibility uh, lecture series. We have eight episodes up there right now. I think it's probably around 10 hours of content um, uh, right there. It's uh, pretty fantastic to understand the uh, romantic uh, relationships of all of the types. Uh, if you would like to join our meetup group, uh, go to csjoseph.life forward slash social, click meetup, and you can get involved with our meetup group. Uh, if you would like to get involved with our Q&A sessions or just join the community, go to the csjoseph.life forward slash social and then go to our Discord server, sign up, put your questions in the Q&A, and then we will be live streaming on, I believe, this Thursday, I think, uh, for another Q&A session uh, with everyone. So it'd be fantastic to see everyone there, and uh, thank you for joining our community. It's been fantastic. Um, so yeah, with all that being said, folks, I'll see you guys later tonight. Good night.